Mr. Petrov, though he insisted I call him Ivan, was not a man I would ordinarily want to spend time with. He held a high position in the company I worked for, my boss's boss's boss. It was only a chance encounter in the office one day that led to him taking a liking to me. I'm not sure what about me he liked so much. I think most likely he missed the days of his youth and saw me as an opportunity to live vicariously through someone. He was a prideful man, a textbook example for every stereotype you could hear about wealthy men from the older generation. I did not want to spend time with him, but I knew it was an opportunity I couldn't pass up. He could quickly raise my status at work, and if I rejected him, he could probably have me fired. Besides, he had invited me to Kitraya Lisa, one of the most exclusive clubs in all of Moscow. When we reached the line of eager people waiting to enter, Mr. Petrov motioned me to follow him to the front. The bouncer said, Ah, Mr. Petrov, good to see you tonight. And without any further discussion, he led Mr. Petrov and me into the club ahead of all those waiting. I had to admit to myself that this was exciting. The inside of the club was incredibly clean and organized. There were low, yellow lights that created a calming atmosphere. I was accustomed to blinding strobe lights and music that made my ears bleed. There was a dance floor here, but they were playing classical music and people were waltzing or swing dancing instead of grinding on each other. It all seemed wholesome until I realized every couple consisted of an older man and one of the young girls who worked at the club. Mr. Petrov smiled at me. Nice, isn't it? Why don't we get a drink and then I'll show you the back room. Back room? I asked. You'll see, he said. He brought me to a booth that was sectioned off. On a plush cushion was a card that read, Mr. Ivan Petrov. He lifted the velvet rope and we sat down. Almost immediately, a girl approached us with a bottle of Glenfiddich whiskey. That one bottle cost more than I made in a year. Mr. Petrov relished my look of astonishment. I know it's not the typical Russian drink, but I've always preferred whiskey to vodka, he said. The girl poured two glasses. Mr. Petrov noticed my hesitation and said, Please, Mikhail, drink with me. I nodded and lifted the glass to my mouth. It was the smoothest thing I had ever drank. It's good, yeah? Mr. Petrov asked with a wrinkled smile. It's incredible, I said. And I was beginning to warm up to him. And he smacked the girl who had served us on the behind and licked his lips. He was a pig, but he was going to take someone under his wing. So it might as well have been me. You know, Mikhail, I like you. You remind me of myself when I was young. I smiled, trying to hide the pain I felt at such an accusation. How so? I asked. Mr. Petrov took a slow sip of his whiskey. He set the glass down and leaned close to me. His leathery skin appeared younger and smooth in the soft light of the club. You have the hunger, he said. The hunger? Yes, son. I see it in your eyes that hunger for something more, never quite being satisfied. You do anything to get what you want. I became uncomfortable. Well, I began, I don't think that's true. Mr. Petrov leaned back and spread his arms across the booth. You just haven't wanted anything badly enough yet, but when you do, believe me, you'll do anything to satisfy that urge. Just like me when I was young. He rolled up his sleeves and I noticed a web of scars sprawling up his arm. He saw me noticing and I quickly looked away. That was from my darling Alina. What do you mean? I asked. Are you saying someone did that to you? He smiled wider, obviously enjoying my confusion. Let me show you how I satisfy the hunger, he said. Let me show you how I make this dull life interesting. A hint of fear pricked the base of my neck. He wasn't just a piggish man who looked down on others. There was something truly strange about him. Part of me wanted to leave. Whatever he was trying to suck me into wasn't worth it, even if I lost my job for upsetting him. But a stronger part of me was curious. I didn't want to admit it, but he was right. I often felt unbearably bored in life, and a desire was growing in me to find something that could entertain me. It was the same desire that led me to share a drink with a man I had always despised. My curiosity won, and I followed him to the back of the club. If I had been impressed by the private booth, it was nothing compared to the door we arrived at. His name was inscribed on a golden placard hanging from the door. The entire private room belonged to him. He opened the door and I stepped into a room that radiated wealth. The light was soft and dim, 
more so than the rest of the club. There were art pieces and statues lining the walls. There were four different alcoves with silk drapes covering the entrances, and behind them were luxurious beds. All of this finery paled in comparison to the gorgeous, naked women throughout the room. Upon our arrival, they immediately got up to embrace Mr. Petrov and kiss him. He laughed. Girls, girls, I want you to meet my friend, Mikhail. He'll be joining us for the evening. Make him feel at home. At his command, they moved over to me and began rubbing their hands across my body. One of them loosened my tie and removed it. I couldn't help but smile widely. I knew it was disgusting. The fact that he had these young women back here. The fact that they would listen to anything he said. But still, I was happy to be there. I was excited. We moved deeper into the room and sat on a couch. One of the girls poured champagne for us. The more I drank, the more comfortable I became. And the less I felt disgusted with Mr. Petrov or Ivan, as he asked me to call him. I was kissing one of the girls. Another was rubbing my thigh when someone stepped out from one of the bedded alcoves. She was radiant, more beautiful than any of the women in the room. And there was something different about her, the way she carried herself. It seemed as if she felt she owned the room as much as Ivan did. Alina, Ivan shouted with joy. He stood up and kissed her. My beautiful flower, did you sleep well? I want you to meet someone. He grabbed her hand and brought her to me, then placed her hand in mine. Who is this? She asked, her voice like silk. I'm, I coughed, I'm Mikhail. He's like us, Ivan said. He can't be satisfied. Why don't you show him how we stay entertained? Alina bit her lip. Her obsidian hair rested just above her bare chest. Leading me by the hand, she pulled me into the alcove and pulled the curtain shut. Take off your clothes, she said. My heart was racing. I had slept with beautiful women before, but no one quite like her. I removed my clothes quickly, albeit awkwardly, and she pushed me back onto the bed. As she kissed me, she ran her hands along my body. I did the same to her. I thought we would become more intimate, but she stopped and whispered, now I'll satisfy your hunger. She opened a drawer next to the bed and pulled out a blade that gleamed in the soft light. I immediately backed away. What the hell are you doing? She shushed me and gently stroked my leg. Relax, we won't do anything you don't want to. We can start with just one small cut. Trust me, it will be like nothing you felt before. I was transfixed by her. Again, I should have left but some part of me wanted her so badly that I would do anything for her. I sat still while she placed the blade on my upper arm. With one quick motion, she cut my flesh. I winced. She immediately began to kiss the wound. She had hurt me, but now she was comforting me. The pain subsided, and I felt endorphins flood my body. It was incredible. She moved the knife to my other arm and cut twice, making an X shape. Blood trickled down my arm and onto the bed below us. Alina kissed me deeply as she pulled the blade across my chest. The wounds were superficial, not deep enough to hit an artery, but still they stung. Each cut, Alina would kiss passionately, staining her lips red. I was losing myself. The feeling was so unique and intense that I couldn't tell if it was pleasurable or painful. A new world opened before me, a world where pain was love, a world where I would never be bored or lonely again. Time slipped away from me. I was caught up in every sensation Alina brought to me. Nothing else mattered. Then, I slipped into darkness. When I awoke, Alina was lying next to me. I jumped up, frightened. She was covered in blood, and so was the bed. I looked down. I was covered in blood. Whatever spell had been placed on me was gone now. My skin ached and burned. What had I done? What had I let her do to me? I pushed past the curtain into the main room. Ivan was asleep on the couch with some of the other girls. He was naked. For the first time, I saw the extent of his depravity. The scars I saw in his arm wove and crisscrossed their way over his entire body. It was almost artistic. Tiny patterns covered his chest and belly and thighs and legs. I felt sick. I turned to look for my clothes when I caught a glimpse of myself in a mirror. Approaching it slowly, I stared in horror. There was so much dried blood on me, it almost looked like I was wearing a red jumpsuit. When I looked closer, I saw the raised bits of flesh where Alina had cut me. It was the same pattern that was on Ivan. The cuts ran up my arms and across my chest. There were a few on my legs. The cuts were not nearly as numerous as Ivan's, but it was a start. This man I had hated. This man I wanted to be nothing like. 
I was starting to look like him. Even my eyes had the same ravenous hunger as his. A sudden realization plunged me into an emotion halfway between relief and dread. I realized that I felt happy. I wanted this. I knew that I would come back despite my horror. I would come back to Alina again and again until I had more cuts on my body than even Ivan. I realized that despite what I wanted to believe about myself, this disgusting, depraved old man and I were one and the same. I walked back into the alcove and lay down next to Alina, putting my arm around her. I felt the stickiness of my own blood on her skin. I moved into the neon glow emanating from the sign that read Zlaya Mish, the angry mouse. The sign hummed like a beehive ready to burst and release a swarm of inconsolable wrath. Zlaya Mish was a popular, albeit seedy, nightclub on the outskirts of St. Petersburg. It was not the type of club you would go to on a date or a casual night out. It was a pulsating beast made of drugs and sex with something sinister at its heart. I took one final drag on my cigarette to calm my nerves and then tossed the fading ember to the ground and stomped it out under the heel of my boot. My hand rested on the cool metal of my Makarov pistol. They would take it from me before I met with him. I knew that, but I hoped the removal of the weapon would be enough to satisfy them and they wouldn't search me further. Alexei, the gruff bouncer, stood in front of the entrance to the club. He smiled knowingly as I approached him. Sergei, he said with a false kindness. Dobro pojolovat, good to see you. Move aside, I said. Ah, yes, Alexei said. Eager to see the boss, huh? I know he is eager to see you too. Not happy with you. Last guy he was unhappy with didn't end up looking too good. I remained silent. How'd you screw up such a simple job anyway? One woman and her kid were too much of a fight for you, eh? I could have done it easily. Just pop up, that's all it takes. Fury started to rise in me. How could he make light of such a thing? How could he be so okay with what the boss had asked me to do? You sicken me. I said through bare teeth. And yet, Alexei said, here you are, same as me. We aren't the same, not at all. You work for him for money. That's all you care about. Oh, and what do you work for, friend? You know exactly what. Boss has something of yours, yeah? Something you want back, something you want to protect. The way I see it, he has something I want too. Doesn't matter what that something is. We both work for him to get something we want. That makes us the same, get it? I didn't want to argue with him, so I shouldered past him into the nightclub. As I walked past, Alexei whispered a sinister dos vidania at me. Inside the club, I was immediately assaulted with a deafening sound and a disorienting array of lights. The club was structured with a low, arched ceiling, which gave it the feeling of being inside a tunnel. Along the ceiling were rows of black lights that stretched from the front of the club, where the DJ was, to the back of the club, where the door I was heading to was. Strobe lights flashed, synchronized to the throbbing beat of the music. The entire room was a mosh pit, everyone packed tightly together, jumping up and down to the music. Humidity arose from the sweating bodies, and it filled me with nausea. Along the sides were couples grinding on each other, their naked flesh gyrating like some inhuman monstrosity. I pushed past the swarm of bodies and made my way to the back of the room. Two large men stood on either side of the door. Boss is waiting for you, one of them said. I motioned for the handle of the door, but a large hand pushed against me. Your gun, the man said. I stared at him for a moment, feigning defiance, then reached to the holster around my chest and handed my pistol over. He stared at me for a moment. I stared right back, trying desperately not to twitch with anxiety. He nodded to the door, then returned his gaze directly ahead of himself, as if I had never even been there. I grabbed the handle and pulled the door open. Inside, there were two men. Lev, our boss, sat behind a table. He held a cigar and thin wisps of smoke rose toward the ceiling of the small room. Beside Lev was Igor, an impossibly large man with the face of an ox. He was more intimidating than all of the club's bouncers and guards put together. The weight of his stare crushed me. Lev stood up and flashed a bright smile. Ah, Sergei, he said. Welcome, welcome. He walked up to me and gave me a tight hug. Come sit with me, he said, and returned to his chair. I sat in the chair across from him. Igor <clears throat> stared into me and let out a boar's grunt. Sergei, how are you? I'm doing well, thanks, I said. You look a little pale. I haven't been working you too hard, have I? He chuckled. <laughs> I said nothing but gave a polite smile. Here, Lev said, pulling out a bottle of vodka and two crystal glasses from his desk drawer. Drink with me, Sergei. Let's talk. 
He poured a small amount into each of the glasses and handed one to me. Don't shoot this, he said. Shit vodka is for shooting, but this is the good stuff. Only the best for my friend. We are friends, no? I didn't know what to say, so I politely smiled again. We both sipped the vodka. Well, Lev continued, I think you think we are friends. You treat me like a friend, like this is a give and take. Some jobs I give you, and you take them. Some jobs I give you, and you give them right back. His friendly demeanor darkened, and he glared at me. Like I tell you a woman and her daughter are a witness to one of my business transactions. I tell you they need to bite the bullet. I give you the bullet they will bite. But then I find out they are alive and well. It was a mistake, boss, I said quickly. I messed up and they heard me coming. They got away, but I can still find them. My hatred for the man steadily rose. I felt the coolness of the steel blade hidden in my boot. Ah, Sergei, Lev said. Listen, I like you, I really do. But I can't have you thinking you can make these mistakes, as you call them. So I have to do something, you know, to ensure no more future mistakes. Lev nodded to Igor, and the mountain of a man pulled out a glimmering cigar trimmer. Which finger? Lev asked me. Boss? I asked with horror. You shoot with your right hand, yeah? Lev said. We'll need to keep that intact. So which finger from your left hand? I'm a reasonable man. I'm letting you choose. I began to sweat. My finger, I thought frantically. He's going to cut off my finger. I could kill him now, pull out the knife. No, no, they would expect me to resist right now. It's not the right time. Not if I want to know where he's keeping her. Igor stepped behind me and slammed my head against the table, pinning me like a mouse. He used his elbow to pin down my left arm. I began to breathe heavily. Fine, Lev said. Igor will choose. I felt the metal ring slip over my middle finger. Before I could even think, the blade clamped down with a sickening wet sound. I screamed. It felt like my middle finger had been replaced with fire. Igor released me, and I clasped my left hand with my right. Blood spurted from the wound and rhythm with my heartbeat. Lev picked up the severed finger. See, he said. That wasn't so bad. I let you off easy, Sergei, because I like you. I quelled my screams and clenched my hand tighter. You don't believe me, Lev said. Come with me. Let me show you how easy I let you off. Igor grabbed me by the shoulder and lifted me to my feet. He pushed me through another door in the room. It led to the large storage house behind the club. The storage house I had counted on to escape through. But when I saw what was inside, I choked on a scream. A man was tied spread eagle to a pile of wooden crates, a face of horror frozen on his pale face. He was naked, and there was a gash that led from his chest down to his groin. His intestines were hanging out of him like nightmarish confetti. Blood pooled on the floor beneath him, and organs I didn't dare identify were scattered in the blood. The man's name had been Arman. I had worked with him on some drug deals a few months back. I didn't like him much, but no one deserved this, except maybe Lev. See, Lev said. Easy, just a finger. Arman, though, I didn't like. All he cared about was money, which made him untrustworthy. But you, Sergei, you care about something else, someone else. So I know you won't make any more mistakes, unless you want to see your daughter in the same position as poor Arman. I had to act quickly. I had to pull courage from somewhere, surprise them while they thought I was still in shock, and I had to take out Igor first. I only had one chance, or he would crush my skull like an egg. Lev turned for a moment and smiled at the bloody corpse. I thought only of my daughter, my sweet Katya. I pulled the long, thin blade from my boot and lunged at Igor. He didn't move as I plunged the blade through his right eye, deep into his skull. The eyeball was tougher than I expected, and I felt sick. It was like sticking a knife through a thick cut of meat. Igor let out a grunt, blood pouring from his eye socket. He stumbled back. I didn't wait to watch him hit the ground. I turned to Lev, who was reaching for his gun. You bastard, he shouted. Just as he raised his pistol to me, I tackled him to the ground. Together, we fell into the sloppy mess of blood and guts on the floor. He reached for my face, and I gave him a sharp jab that shattered his nose and left him disoriented. Where is she? I demanded. He laughed and spat blood in my face. The anger in me was untamable. At last, I was confronting the lion who had toyed with me for so long, but I had no weapon to threaten him with. His gun had slid far out of reach. I looked at the bloody mess around us. I forced Katya into the forefront of my mind. I reached for the tangled slop of Armand's intestines. Grabbing a thick rope of his innards, I positioned myself behind Lev and pulled the intestines tight around his throat. He began to choke. I wrapped a second layer of intestine around his neck, fearing the first might tear. As I pulled tighter, watery blood spilled from the intestines as if I were wringing out a wet rag. Moscow! Lev wheezed. I loosened my grip slowly. Your daughter, he continued frantically, is in Moscow, in my safe house, near Red Square. 
He must have thought I would let him go. Maybe a better man would have, but I had already come this far. I pulled the flesh ropes tight again and watched his face grow red. Horrible, guttural noises escaped him. The blood from his nose poured faster as pressure built in his face. His veins looked ready to burst. Then he went limp. I released my grip and lay back in the sticky blood, suddenly aware of a smell like pennies. I no longer felt any pain from my missing finger. As I sat in the horrifying filth, I began to cry. But at least my daughter would finally be free. I generously poured silver rum into the Boston shaker along with simple syrup and fresh lime juice. Closing the shaker, I began to jostle it in a methodic motion. I couldn't help but sink the shaking of the metal container to the beat of the music resounding throughout the club. Three college-aged girls waited across the counter. One of them smiled at me and leaned in. Can you do any tricks for us? She asked, a hint of vodka on her breath. I feigned confusion. What kind of tricks? You know, she said. Like those tricks you see on the internet all the time. Like tossing drinks around and stuff. Her finger twirled, thick locks of her golden hair as she <laughs> stared at me. I smiled. Oh, I began. Do you mean like this? I tossed the shaker behind my head and caught it on the other side. Is that it? She asked playfully. I smiled wider and tossed the shaker up into the air. It landed on my shoulder and then rolled down the length of my upper arm. When it reached my elbow, I jerked and it shot back into the air. Switching hands, I let the silver container roll down the back of my right arm and come to a controlled stop in the crease of my elbow. The girl was now <laughs> visibly impressed. I was about to continue my routine when I heard a patronizingly slow clap. A man who had been sitting at the bar for a few hours was staring at me. He stood up and staggered over to the girl. If you're impressed that easy, he slurred, then you'll love a guy like me. The girl let out a nervous laugh and moved away <laughs> slightly. The man looked back at me. He was still wearing his work clothes. His top button was undone and his tie was loose around the neck. Only one side of his shirt was tucked into his pants. He had been there before my shift and clearly Dimitri, the bartender on shift before me, had given him far more drinks than the club's policy allowed. That's shit, he said, staring at me. Not impressive, not worth her time. I finished pouring the daiquiris for the three girls and handed them their glasses so that they could leave quickly. The girl who had been flirting with me mouthed spasibo, which is thank you in Russian, and she hurried off to some tables near the edge of the dance floor. The drunken man turned to follow and called out, Where are you going, beautiful? I grabbed him by the wrist. She doesn't want to talk with you, I said, so leave her alone. He stared at me, unmoving. By all accounts, he was an average looking 30 something year old, albeit a 30 something year old who was plastered. But when I locked eyes with him, there was something off. The way he stared was unsettling. His pupils almost seemed to writhe, like there was a darkness stirring underneath. I felt that beneath this very average man, there was something sinister lurking. He blinked. Fine, he said, pulling his wrist away. Be useful and get me a drink. No, I said, you're cut off. If you wanna sit quietly at the bar, you can, but I'm not serving you anything else tonight. He stared at me again. His disheveled hair stood up on either side of his head, unnervingly similar to a devil's horns. Cut off, the man repeated. Yes, I said. Cut off, he muttered again. Cut off, he repeated a third time. Then he smiled as if he had just realized something. His eyes were looking at me, but not quite fixed on me. I grew increasingly uncomfortable. He <laughs> laughed and immediately headed for the exit door, pausing only to turn and smile at me one last time. Then he left and I was glad to have him gone. I returned to my work and poured drinks for those who had been waiting, but none of them seemed as disturbed by what had just happened as I was. They only appeared annoyed at having to wait longer. The rest of the night continued like any other night. There was the occasional rowdy patron, overly patriotic Russians prepared to die for the motherland but they always ended up being all talk and would leave it at the first appearance of a threatening bouncer. The girl I had been talking to left a few hours before closing. She left without her friends. As she passed me, she offered another thank you and then she was gone. By the end of the night, my mind had settled. The tedious task of polishing glasses after closing was always effective in clearing my head. Igor, the manager of the club, told me I could head home and that he would lock up. I stepped out into the brisk air and headed for my car. The night was dark. Clouds blocked all light from the stars. I became painfully aware of my aloneness and hurried into my vehicle, 
making sure to lock the doors behind me. As I drove home, a car pulled out of one of the side alleys and carried on behind me. Its high beams were on, and I felt a headache creeping into my skull as the light blared into my eyes. I turned left, so did the car behind me. That was no cause for worry, I reassured myself. Whoever was driving was just heading in the same direction. But every turn I made on my way to my apartment, the car behind me made as well. Despite the frigid temperature inside my car, I began to sweat. No one is following me, I thought to myself. It's not him. He was just some drunk asshole. My heartbeat drummed in my ears, increasing the pressure in my hand. I made an abrupt right turn, a turn I didn't need to take. The car sped past me. I came to a stop in the middle of the road and sighed with relief. It was all in my head. Still, I waited a moment to see if the car would turn back around to find me. It didn't. When I reached my apartment complex, I hurried up the steps to the second floor and locked my room door behind me. The television had been left on and I welcomed the monotonous sound of the local news station. It made me feel less alone. I grabbed a bottle of Otrakovo from the fridge and sat on the couch. The alcohol did its work and I began to relax. There was a knock on my window. I froze, not wanting to turn, not wanting to let bother me whatever had knocked on my reality. But it knocked again. I turned and every stupid fear I had felt throughout that night became real. There he was, on the fire escape. He was still wearing the loose tie. He still had only one side of his collared shirt tucked in, but now he was holding something. It was long. A baseball bat? Had he come to beat me to death? Fear fell on me when I remembered I had forgotten to lock the window. The man lifted it open and tossed the object inside. Cut off, he yelled and laughed wildly. The object made a sickening thud and rolled awkwardly onto my carpet. My mouth was agape. It was a severed arm. It looked like it had belonged to a woman. My mind immediately went to the girl at the club. She had left alone. Blood spattered my carpet and I continued to stare at the nightmarish length of flesh. My brain could barely comprehend that this thing could have once been attached to a human. I didn't want to believe it. I heard a loud thud and looked up. The window was closed and the man was gone. With shaking hands, I pulled my phone from my pocket to call the police, but paused when I heard the blare of sirens. Writhing red and blue lights flooded the night outside my apartment. Had they seen the man? Were they going to arrest him already? Even if they were here for unrelated reasons, I had to go get them now. I flung my door open and found that two officers were already in the hall. Slava Bogu, I muttered in relief. Hands up, an officer yelled, his gun drawn. What? I said hands up now. I lifted my hands into the air. He was staring behind me. I realized he had drawn his gun when he saw the arm on my floor. Please, I said. There was a man here. He, shut up, the other officer said. We got a tip that a girl had been kidnapped. A girl who was last seen at the club you work at. My heart dropped into my stomach. That man had called the police. He was trying to frame me. Please, I repeated. He hurt her, maybe even killed her. He's just outside. Listen, the officer said. When you have a girl's arm on your living room floor, that makes you the prime suspect. So shut up and open your closet. My closet? The tip said the girl was stuffed into a closet. They saw from the alley. Fine, I thought. When they see my closet is empty, then they'll have to listen to me. They motioned me into my bedroom with their guns. I grabbed the handle of my closet and pulled. What we all saw inside lacerated my sanity. I couldn't move. Inside the closet was a multitude of body parts, all hooked onto clothing hangers and hung among my regular outfits. A pair of bloodied feet pierced on the same hook, a motionless heart on another, hunks of meat I couldn't recognize on others. On the floor of my closet were two legs and another arm. The hooked body parts were dripping blood like rain. The crown of horror sat atop my dresser where I kept my folded shirts. It was her head. It was the girl's head, the sweet girl, the innocent girl. I felt my body hit the floor as an officer tackled me, my face now touching one of the bloody legs, my nose pressed into the meaty flesh where a foot should have been, metal clamped down on my wrists and I was lifted to my feet. How? I thought. How did he know where I live? How did he put all this in here? As they dragged me outside down the hall, I wanted to tell them everything that had happened. I wanted to tell them that this was a misunderstanding, but I couldn't speak. Fear silenced me. They were saying something to me, but I couldn't hear them. I felt sick as they shoved me into the back of their patrol car. I'm innocent, I thought. There has to be proof somewhere. I won't be shipped off to Siberia for something I didn't do. As the patrol car pulled away from the apartments, I saw a figure, coated in red and blue light, standing across the street. The patches of blood on his tie and collared shirt looked like pits of pure darkness. I wanted to scream at the officers to look, but I still couldn't speak. The man smiled at me, 
He looked genuinely happy. He lifted a hand and waved as if he were saying goodbye to an old friend. Then he turned and disappeared into the cold night. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and smash that like button to get notified every time I upload a new video. You can also check out some more of my animated horror stories right here.